Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, IC the ICIS uh, webinar, Guidelines for Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence and Medical Imaging. I'm Fred Pryor, uh, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Khan, is currently having some technical difficulties. All right, I see that Dr. Khan has joined us, which is good, and it's uh, about two minutes past the hour, so I'm going to uh, start with some of the preliminaries. Um, again, welcome to this uh, ICIS webinar. I will be, it is being recorded and will be made available on the ICIS uh, uh, website. And uh, I apologize, there are a little bit of dog barking in the background. I'm working from my home office. So um, we want to thank our sponsor for this webinar, uh, Lucida Medical. They uh, have been kind enough to sponsor this so that it is free for the participants. And um, I would like to, you to join them at RSNA this year if you are uh, attending. Uh, ICS would also like you to be aware that you can follow us on Twitter and on other social media channels uh, to keep up with what's going on. And for some reason, my slides want to advance themselves, so we'll try to control that. But uh, because we have a lot to cover today, I think I will uh, get started and then we'll let others join. And I will introduce Dr. Khan uh, as we make the transition from my part of the presentation to his. So um, I'm gonna start this off talking about trustworthy AI and medical imaging from the point of view of guiding principles that uh, developers can use as they try to develop AI and that researchers can use, uh, or that uh, those who want to use these tools can use to evaluate uh, how well the tools are developed. And I am really getting annoyed by the fact that my slides keep advancing themselves. So um, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And um, I'm gonna start off with a question of why should you trust an AI algorithm? So there's growing concern that the results are inconsistent, they're not necessarily biologically relevant, and that black box algorithms just aren't trustworthy. And so as an example, uh, a cancer imaging AI algorithm produced the right answer, where right is defined as it showed us what we think we know about this particular, say, cancer uh, from a radiology image. But it gave us the right answer for all the wrong reasons. What it was looking at in the image made no sense. So is this an example of a bad algorithm that shouldn't be trusted? Or is this an example of an opportunity to design experiments to understand if the features that the algorithm discovered are really biologically important? Is it a way for us to do new experiments or pose new hypotheses to gain new knowledge? And I think this is a key question in trustworthy AI is um, particularly with deep learning algorithms, they may find things that we are not aware of. And so, uh, we have this interesting problem of trust versus new knowledge. Uh, please, if you're coming on board, uh, mute. I hear some other noise in the background besides my barking dogs. So learning to trust AI is a critical question, and it has a number of different dimensions to it. But to be acceptable in clinical practice, an algorithm really has to be transparent interpretable, and we use in the technical term explainable. So it's not enough just to get the right answer. You have to get the answer in a way that is understandable to both the researchers and the clinicians who are going to trust this algorithm so that it, it makes sense and they that we build up a, a level of trust. So this requires techniques that can deconstruct the decision-making process so that we can understand what happened, what, the algorithm used. And so this is just an example from a paper by Holzinger. This was a natural image, you know, a, a rooster and some flowers. It goes into a machine learning algorithm and it classifies it as a rooster with a particular probability. Okay, well, you can then run that through an explainability algorithm, which backtracks to say, what part of the image did it use? And in this example, there's a heat map that said it used this region of the image, which is pretty much the comb and the rooster's head. That's what separate, made it decide it was a rooster. Well, is that good enough for us to trust that this thing actually knows what a rooster is? Um, 
But this kind of algorithm helps us to develop that trust. It also helps us to debug the al algorithms, to verify the predictions, and maybe to identify new knowledge that there is something very significant about, say, the rooster's comb that makes it distinguishable from flowers. Uh, I'm not sure that is new knowledge in this case, but I think you get the idea. But the whole point of this is to deconstruct the algorithm so we have trust. But is that enough? Is that really enough to make, make us believe that we have reliable algorithms? So the real question I'm trying to address today is how to make trustworthy AI-based uh, imaging tools. And of course, this really depends upon having a rigorous development and evaluation process for these tools. Rigor is the key in, in science in general, but in particular in the development of new uh, machine learning based tools. Now, there are two ways of looking at this, at, at enforcing rigor. One is through regulatory frameworks, and we're going to talk a bit about regulatory frameworks that exist uh, both here in the US and internationally. And then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about best practice guidelines. This is an area of research that I and others, many others have been involved in to try to really put the rigor into the, into the field of how do we develop tools and how do we evaluate them? How do we make them trustworthy? What, what needs to be done in order to make that happen? So um, let's dig into some of these uh, regulatory frameworks to start with. And the one that's most familiar to us here in the US is the one created by the US Food and Drug Administration. They've created a total product life cycle regulatory framework for AI and machine learning based uh, algorithms. And they call such tools SAMD, software enabled medical devices. And so um, this is their framework that uh, has a lot of moving parts, but the keys are to establish a culture of quality and organizational excellence. So the process of developing the tools has to be a well-regulated development process. And there, the FDA has a long history of defining what that means. They go through a pre-market assurance for safety and effectiveness for such tools, just like they do for pharmaceuticals. But they add a review of both the pre-specifications and the algorithm change protocol, because they assume that when you put this into practice, you've trained an algorithm on and, and validated it and proved that it solves a particular problem reliably, but it's gonna to continue to learn in practice. And so they want to monitor that retraining pipe, uh, part of the pipeline because they understand that the algorithm isn't static in practice, but it will continue to learn and it may actually wander off the reservation and no longer become, be reliable. So there's a long-term monitoring process built into their regulatory approach. And I think that's an, that's an important part of this. They also focus on data selection and data management, how you train and tune the algorithm, which is really important. Um, and then of course, how do you validate that, which re requires appropriate data for both training and, and uh, validation. So this is a very nice framework. And they back it up with a joint venture with the um, National Institutes of Health here in the US that's called the MDDT program, or Medical Device Development Tools Program. The goal of this program is to facilitate device development and evaluation um, by providing uh, necessary data that uh, can be used for the evaluation to uh, make sure that the devices are um, efficient and that their results are predictable. And so it's part of the regulatory submission process to the FDA, and they've been working uh, closely with the, with the NIH, as I said, to gather and sequester appropriate data for this independent validation. And they've defined a set of categories, which I won't go into in, in significant detail, but you can see their tools for clinical outcome assessment, biomarker testing, and then non-clinical assessment models. Each of these have their own set of requirements because they're, they're different contexts of use, which is an important concept in this framework that, uh, in which the, the tools are evaluated. So this is a nice regulatory framework and there's 
very detailed documentation of what a developer of a commercial tool has to do in order to get it through the FDA approval process. Now there's a, a shorter version of this, if you will, and it's a joint project with the, uh, uh, between the Food and Drug Administration in the US, Health Canada, and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency in the UK. They came up in uh, late uh, 2021 with the GMLP, the Good Machine Learning Practice for Medical Device Development, and it's a set of guiding principles. You can see the, the principles are all very nice, they're very important, but they're also a bit loosely defined. And I think that's one of the, the issues that, um, although there's, there's documentation to back this up, these are not necessarily actionable uh, or as well-defined as you would like. So the inverse is true in the trustworthy AI program that the EU uh, launched in which they're looking uh, uh, through this entire life cycle, as I've already mentioned, and have established a whole set of requirements that include accountability, robustness, dealing with privacy and, and data governance. And in their case, they've created over 500 detailed recommendations for developers to meet. Uh, and these apply not just to imaging, but to all AI products, much as the SAMD approach for the FDA applies to all product, medical products that contain an AI or machine learning component. So there was also a, a joint uh, working group that included the trustworthy AI uh, participants, as well as uh, participants from a number of different uh, European and North American um, societies. And this was reported in the paper in radiology. And it focused on a key component of this, which is not the technical component, but rather the code of ethics and practice for AI that's really needed to make sure that we are focused on the common good and that we are um, not violating either patient privacy and, and, and uh, the ethical use of patient data, but also that the tools are going to not contain a bias against uh, either implicit or, in, or explicit against a particular community. So this is a, an important aspect of um, the idea of trustworthy AI, the whole ethics component that has a technical piece of it that the, the data has to not be biased. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a, in a minute, but also that the use of the tools should not have either implicit or explicit bias uh, that um, and, and guidelines for, for such um, code of ethics need to be developed. Now, within the US, there's a program called Bridge to AI, and it's uh, an NIH program that's developing huge collections of data for evaluating um, AI based tools. And that entire program is focused on developing these codes of, of ethics. Okay, so regulatory frameworks are really important but they're not really enough. And there's a lovely paper by uh, Kurt Langlotz and, and his colleagues at Stanford, where they looked at the regulatory frameworks for developing and evaluating AI-based tools, particularly in imaging. And they said these things really fall short for a number of key reasons. First of all, the, they conflate the diagnostic task with the diagnostic algorithm, right? So a diagnostic algorithm is not the same as the me medical task that's being performed. Uh, a human being is likely going to perform the task. The algorithm is perhaps going to help in, in that task, but the two are not the same thing. And, and so the regulatory algorithms tend to focus on the algorithm and not the overall task. They give sort of a superficial treatment to this diagnostic task because it's not the focus. There's no real mechanism for directly comparing similar algorithms. So I have a new algorithm, but is it really a better at, at the, performing this diagnostic task than already existing algorithms? They don't really sufficiently characterize safety and performance, although that's key in the FDA's program. There's some shortcomings in terms of their safety evaluation. 
there really a lack of res there's a lack of resources to assess performance at each installed site. So this is nice when the vendor goes through the process with, let's say, the Food and Drug Administration, but when you install it in your hospital, it may not work the same way. And there's no real way of, of evaluating that. And then there's some essentially inherent conflict of interest uh, because the vendors are trying to get a product to market, the FDA is trying to protect the, the, the public, and a lot of the conflict of interest goes uh, uh, centers on the data and who's controlling the data. And uh, you know, the FDA wants to sequester data uh, from the from the whole entire uh, community. So we, you know, we're not quite uh, clear on exactly how this has been evaluated. So uh, their paper is really nice in laying out all these points, probably better than than I've just done. But it then says, well, okay, if this is if the regulatory frameworks are falling short, what should we do? And they proposed a really nice phase development and evaluation process, which I think most of us actually try to use in practice. There's first a feasibility phase, which is I'm going to use small data sets just to see if this thing, if the idea makes sense, if it is feasible. If, if it's not going to work at all, or if the signal to noise is just so bad that I would need a hundred million samples in order to make this work, well, that's not gonna happen. And then there's a capability phase where you're actually seeing that this works in a controlled environment. So we're controlling the quality of the data, we're controlling the operational characteristics of the model. Okay, that's good. Now, if we pass that phase, we go to an effectiveness, real world performance. How does this work in a real clinical environment? and to do more local validation of performance at any given site. But again, it's a limited number of sites. Um, and then that leads us to the final phase, which is a durability phase, where now you're gonna monitor it at lots of sites and also deal with this continuous learning problem that the FDA highlighted. So I think this is a really nice way of thinking about the, a well-designed development and evaluation process going through these stages. They also added performance elements. Most people who are developing AI uh, algorithms really focus on accuracy and, or they look at the um, uh, sensitivity and specificity characteristics of their model. But there are a lot of other key parameters that need to be dealt with. And you'll see these as recurring themes in, in this talk. But reliability, applicability, does this model, does this mo algorithm actually solve a, uh, the problem it's intended to? Is it deterministic? Um, are there appropriate fail-safe mechanisms? Is the logic transparent so that we can trust it? You see the point. So they, they propose a number of additional evaluation and performance criteria that aren't necessarily well, part of the, at least the US uh, regulatory frameworks. Okay, so those are the regulatory, that's the regulatory approach and sort of the pros and cons. I'm going to switch now to uh, the best practice guidelines. And I'm going to focus in particular on one that I'm involved in. It's called the Future AI Project. It's a, it started off as a pro project among these five big EU projects funded by the Horizon 2020 program in the EU. UCAN Image is the project that I'm involved in. It's led by Karim Lekader at the University of Barcelona. So uh, many of the slides here are a joint venture with Karim. So I wanted to uh, make that clear. And this is a project that involves a very large number of people. Um, scattered all over the world. So we were trying to develop best practice framework that's not country specific, but is globally applicable. And so uh, we started off with 52 uh, guidelines. It's now uh, down to 30 that have, have been refined. We're continuing to refine that process. The guidelines and best practices for are really focused on AI and medical imaging. So it's a collaborative work to define these consensus guidelines for trustworthy AI. We really focus on, as I said, medical imaging. Um, the approach is very interdisciplinary and holistic. You saw the large number of people that come from a wide variety of backgrounds. The guidelines are relatively compact. I said, we've got it down to 30 recommendations at this point. And this is a dynamic process. There's a website here, futureai.eu. These guidelines evolve as we get more feedback and as the field advances. 
This is what Future AI stands for. It's actually an acronym, fairness, universality, traceability, usability, robustness, and explainability. And I'm gonna go through each one of these briefly to, to give you an idea of both what the 30 um, guidelines really look like and what each of these categories mean. Now, there is a draft, a preprint, the reference is here. Uh, the actual final paper hit my inbox this morning. So it's still very much a work in progress and continuously being refined, but the, the real paper will be out shortly. So what do we mean by fairness? Well, we're familiar with the fair principles of for data sharing, but here what we're really focusing more on is, did we collect enough information about the populations that are being used for training and testing so that we can avoid bias? The focus here is really to be fair in the data that we use and the way the, way the algorithms are used. This, part of the ethics component. And so this is just a, an example article looking at underdiagnosis bias in AI uh, because of a uh, lack of underserved patient, uh, sample for under, underserved patient populations, which is a very frequent problem. We've also found in some of our work um, in mammography, uh, low versus high de breast density in mammography, there's a very uh, bias in the normal mammography sample population. And so how do you deal with that? So these are the kind of questions that we think of in fairness. Universality is really generalizability. Is this going to be actually useful as a tool beyond what we have um, tested on in, you know, in, our, in our microcosmic environment. So we wanna make sure that we draw on clinical and biomedical annotation standards, but really we're focusing on evaluation criteria like the ones from the, from the Stanford group that I've already listed. And that in particular AI models have to be tested on external data sets and they must be tested in multiple clinical environments, much as the Stanford group said. And so I, I chose this example, again, from, from Kurt's uh, group, because it was a great example, uh, not of the imaging, but of, ex of natural language processing of text from radiology reports, where they tested it on multiple, in multiple clinical environments and multiple uh, independent data sets. Very, very much following the, the uh, best practice that they laid out for themselves. And interestingly enough, it worked very well until they got to a pediatric population where it failed completely, which highlights the fact that lifespan needs to be taken into account when we design these models. So that's universality. Traceability has to do with how well it's documented, how well we have looked at the intended use, the target populations, uh, after deployment, this continuous monitoring that we saw with, with both the Stanford recommendations and the FDA. And uh, going through this entire life cycle that repeats, right? And so being able to trace what's happening to the algorithm throughout that uh, entire life cycle. Usability is... Uh, very focused on meeting clinical requirements and uh, both for the end users who are patients as well as the clinicians. So there's proper documentation, et cetera. But really what you want is for the algorithm to be used and not as, as in this example, where you can see that never was the most frequent use category for this particular AI algorithm. That's been a long tradition in uh, CAD, uh, in, you know, in medical imaging, that the algorithms are very exciting, but in, in practice, they aren't used. You have to avoid that. And so usability criteria are, are critical. Explainability, I've already mentioned. We really need to make sure that we have done the explainability analysis. This is a little example, actually a fairly big example, using voice spectral analysis from healthy controls versus Parkinson's patients to track disease progression in this Parkinson's uh, population based on changes in how they pr uh, pronounce both a basic sound, ah, uh, versus reading a particular passage. And it uses an imaging, a convolutional neural network, so a, an imaging technique, and then a grad can, which is an explainability technique. 
And we did some experiments where we knew, for example, that males versus females would have a shift in the frequency, space frequency range. And so we could see that's really what the algorithm was picking up to help us be sure that we understood the explainability algorithm. I also want to highlight the fact that this figure and this work was done by Ms. Anu Iyer, who is a very precocious high school student that is, I have the privilege of working with. Robustness has to do with uh, whether the data is trained in representative, I'm sorry, the models are trained in representative data, but also dealing with problems such as uh, the adversarial robustness problem. So this is an example from Ian Goodfellow. This is the original image, which was classified as a panda. Uh, this amount of random noise was added. It's a very tiny amount of noise. And all of a sudden, the same algorithm said, this is very definitely a gibbon. Well, you can't, we can't see the difference between the two images, but the algorithm clearly failed the robustness test. So this kind of testing, which is called white box adversarial robustness testing is really important. And then finally, there are general um, criteria or general guidelines that have to do with making sure interdisciplinary teams are involved and that we um, deal with the ethical risks involved in this development. So. Uh, that was a bit longer than I had expected, but I, I went through that uh, set of requirements. And I'll leave you with this, which is my introduction to my colleague, um, who will be speaking next. Uh, um, well, hmm, I hope he is still on the uh, uh, conference here. He is, he's disappeared. But anyway, Dr. Khan is the uh, editor of Radiology AI. And this is a set of criteria from the Radiology uh, Journal uh, on best practices for authors, reviewers, and readers of AI and machine learning manuscripts. These are the criteria that I introduce to every one of my graduate students as a starting point. So I, they're highly recommended. And I want to thank you. And I'm hoping I can turn the floor over to Dr. Khan. Um, Fred, can you hear me OK? I can. Yeah, somehow it has me appearing on screen and as Dr. Fred Pryor, which I'm oh. taking as an honor, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you and and uh, and welcome to everyone. I'm, I'm glad you're able to join us. I'm going to go ahead and get my presentation started here, and uh, then I'll be able to uh, to show that to you. Just one moment here. All right. Just have to get. It's tricky with only one screen, and I have to get back to the control panel in order to get it to uh, to show my slides. So I apologize here. Well, it's just a moment to uh, get that back. Wow. Okay, here we go. Uh, this will stop screen sharing. Yes, and here we go. Okay, uh, so I think you should have my screens up, uh, my slides up in front of you there. Um, it seems to have taken me to the end of my presentation. Yes, you're starting at the, at the How end. How about that? Well, you know, it's not a bad place to, okay, there we go. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to uh, to be here and, and uh, to share this platform with Dr. Prior, and I, I'm going to continue on some of the same themes uh, that he addressed, and particularly relating to trustworthiness of artificial intelligence in medical imaging, because as we're seeing these systems being developed, and now as they're starting to come into actual clinical practice, we want to have an understanding of, of what it is uh, that allows us to work with these systems effectively to believe the output that, uh, that we get from them. And I'm, and, uh, I'm, I'm in the position, as, as Fred mentioned, I, I serve as uh, editor for the journal Radiology Artificial Intelligence. And I do receive some salary support from the RSNA for that. I have no uh, commercial conflicts of interest. And so it's my privilege to read a lot of papers uh, that, that relate to uh, artificial intelligence and medical imaging. And um, it's, uh, that's a, a great joy. And I want to just share some of the lessons that, that we've learned with that um, and uh, ways that you can as a reader, all of us readers and consumers of the medical literature, how we all can uh, take advantage of that. First off, I guess I just want to remind everyone that, you know, we talk about AI, but in modern radiology, we really conflate 
deep learning, which are the, this incredibly powerful new set of technologies that have really only been around since about 2012. And we conflate that with this broader term of AI, but just a reminder that AI is a, a larger field uh, overall. Um, so a couple of things. Um, uh, the, uh, when we look at a, a paper, and I'm talking first off about scientific validity of, of AI systems, we really want to look at four major things. We want to look at the hypothesis and what exactly they're trying to evaluate. It's very important to look at the data and understand how the data were formulated and, and how that information was brought forward. And the reason is that unlike traditional computer science projects where it was the software, the programming code that really drove the project with modern AI, it's the data. And it's, it's from those data that the model learns and then is applied in clinical situations. We'll talk just a little bit about the AI models, but I also want to talk a bit about uh, evaluation of the model because that, that, uh, that's an important aspect as well. So first off, when we think about the hypothesis, the first thing you do when you read an abstract, you look at a paper, is, is the hypothesis clearly defined? And are they seeking to address some important clinical or scientific question? And then is that hypothesis testable? Uh, and are they using a retrospective analysis? And for the most part, the, the things that have been done so far in, in radiology to a large extent uh, have been done retrospectively. Um, in that uh, they've been based on, on data sets that people have already developed and they're, they're not necessarily being extended prospectively. But what's being tested in this, uh, in this experiment? Are they just seeking to do an exploratory study to see if an algorithm can work, if it's feasible, or are they really analyzing the performance? And, and if so, to what are they comparing it? Are they comparing it with, with human performance or with some other algorithm? It's really important to understand that when you look at a work. When it comes to the data that are used in these systems, it's, it's important to understand where the data came from and how the variables were defined. The RSNA and the American College of Radiology together have undertaken an initiative to develop something called CDEs, Common Data Elements. These uh, provide a standardized way to describe the data that could appear in a radiology report uh, reported by a, a radiologist or that could be generated by an AI system. But we do it in such a way that those data are consistent from one site and one application to another. And uh, so that's important. And, and uh, you can go out and learn about that at radelement.org. But one of the things when you look at AI systems and how they've been built is what were the, what were the criteria that the uh, investigators used to include or exclude cases. Um, how did they determine the quantity of data that they used in the study? I, I will tell you, it seems most often when people have a study that had 500 cases of something, it's not because they did a power analysis and realized that 500 cases was what was needed to prove their hypothesis. It's because that's, it was a convenient sample. That's, that's what they had available to them. And I think Fred touched on this and it's, it's very important and I'm gonna come back to it a little bit, but how well do the training data match the intended clinical use of the system? And we've seen numerous instances where a system that was trained in one setting brought over to another uh, just absolutely flops. And uh, despite the uh, good intentions and careful attention uh, that was put into the development of the system, that can be one of the challenges that with all of these systems, it's important to understand the so-called ground truth, the reference data on which the uh, system was built. And for that, it's important that the system be, uh, the ground truth be data be well-defined and that we understand who or what annotated that data. In other words, understanding what qualifications or training those individuals had, what instructions they were given, um, was more than one person involved in annotating the data? And if so, what was the inter-rater variability? Even better, what was the intra-rater variability if each person got uh, to, to 
label the same image or same piece of information more than once? How, how much variability was there in that case? And then how do they adjudicate any differences in, the, in those attenuations? So uh, this image down in the bottom right of the screen here actually um, is uh, from the New York Times and uh, it's captioned, artificial intelligence is learning from humans, many humans. This uh, is actually a group of individuals. I don't know their qualifications, but they're labeling colonoscopy exams and they're identifying polyps. So it's often the case that you have, uh, we've had large efforts with, uh, with lots of people involved to label these images. And just to show you what impact some of that can have, this was from the RSNA pneumonia detection challenge. It was a competition where they took 30,000 of the chest x-ray images that had been released publicly by the NIH, but uh, those images were uh, had been labeled just with the information from the reports of, of those studies. What the RSNA did was they actually, in collaboration with uh, members of the Society of Thoracic Imaging, uh, they had expert chest radiologists draw these rectangles called bounding boxes to actually show on the radiograph where the suspected pneumonia was. And it turns out that for the test images, they had three radiologists labeling them and they took the intersection of the three bounding boxes, the, the labels that were applied to the, the images by those three radiologists. Well, it turned out that those who won the competition recognized that because it was going to be the intersection of those bounding boxes, uh, that it would be relatively small. And so by uh, going for a relatively small but uh, uh, specific uh, area to label up the images, that's how they were able uh, to win that competition. So, so what you choose for your ground truth can have an impact on quite a variety of things. As people work through these systems, there's a challenge in preparing the data uh, to make that available. There are various techniques called normalization. I'm not going to go into that, but it's just important to have some understanding of exactly how the data have been manipulated uh, before uh, they've been used in the system. And then important to recognize too that um, because much of the work for medical imaging actually has grown out of systems that were initially designed to do uh, photographic images that they're really not uh, set up to take this, the image matrix size like 512 squared or 1024 squared or 256 by 256 that we use in medical images. Instead, they have these uh, unusual image sizes like 224 squared um, that can cause some loss of information uh, when those images are manipulated. And as well, there's reduced bit depth. There's less grayscale information uh, that can be uh, that can be used in in these systems. For many of the systems, there's there's a, a technique called data augmentation, which allows one to add images uh, into the training regime for an AI system. For for some things, you you can do things that make a lot of sense. For for example, that top row showing. Uh, things from the DMIST data set that is used for recognizing numerical digits. It's useful to flip the digits left to right, top to bottom. Um, but you can imagine you don't want to do that with chest radiographs uh, and uh, you really can't do it with medical images. There are some things you can and that we should do. And as Dr. Pryor mentioned, because of uh, that notion of so-called adversarial attack or adversarial images, it's important to add noise often into these images in order to improve the robustness of, of these systems and their ability to, uh, to overcome uh, noise that they might see. When you uh, evaluate these systems as well, it's uh, important to understand the, the way the data have been partitioned. Um, typically, you take a, your uh, collection of data, you put 70% into your training set, and then use 20% for what is called validation or tuning, and then keep a smaller portion of it, 10% reserved for testing at the very end. But it's important that that uh, test set be disjoint and at least at the level of the patient. Um, it is uh, 
a significant problem that we're beginning to see that there can be so-called leakage of data between the testing and the training set, which can render the reproducibility uh, of these systems to be uh, effectively meaningless. Um, so it's, it's really important that you understand as you read these manuscripts uh, that describe AI systems, how did, the, uh, how did the authors handle their data? I will say there are a wide variety of, of architectures. Uh, almost all of these are in a sense off the shelf in that you can download them from Google. And in fact, the, this is the piece of the AI system that, that I worry the least about um, because in many ways, these, these models are relatively standard. It's, it's much more important to understand how the data have been been used and been processed and, and how the, uh, the training and testing has been conducted. And another key aspect to think about uh, are the metrics that are used uh, to evaluate these systems. Um, I think a lot of us have heard the term DICE score or DICE similarity index. It's, uh, it's this one that you're seeing over here in, in part A of, of this illustration that is a measure of the overlap of the target area and the area that's been detected by the AI algorithm. And this is widely used for testing and measuring the performance of, of segmentation algorithms, algorithms that are meant to identify and let's say spot a uh, the metastasis within the liver. Uh, there are a variety of other metrics that can be used. One is called intersection over union or IOU. Uh, there's one over on the right called the Hausdorff dimension, which gets a little bit uh, more abstruse, but um, almost all the work that I see uses the dice coefficient, but it's important to recognize the task that's being conducted. And I'll just show you one example where something can fail. So over on the right, the reference, let's say we're looking at uh, a CT of the liver and you have one large metastasis and two small satellite lesions. So you have an AI system, this prediction one here, that does a pretty good job of finding the large lesion, but completely misses the two smaller ones. And then you have prediction two, which does a pretty good job of finding the large lesion, but and also finds the two smaller ones. In fact, though, if you use the dice coefficient, prediction one looks a whole lot better. And this isn't so much a failure of the metric itself, but it's a and I, the notion that we've applied the wrong metric. It's not the right way to measure the performance of an AI system for the task that we have in mind because we do want a system that's going to detect those small satellite lesions. The other thing is when it comes to performance, most often, um, as, as Fred was describing, people will report sensitivity, specificity, or just a simple accuracy uh, measure. It's valuable to have a receiver operating curve uh, and to get the area under the curve. But remember, um, just measuring the area under the curve, hoping it's 0.95 or greater, something like that, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you have the best possible system. And in fact, um, you have to remember a couple of things about ROC. One is that it assumes that both the normals and abnormals, the positive and negatives, have a Gaussian or normal distribution, a bell curve distribution. Uh, that may or may not be the case. It's also the fact that you may only want to look at a certain part of the receiver operating curve. For example, if you're doing a system for, to, to look for breast cancer on mammograms, you may only want to look at the parts of the curve that have 90% or greater sensitivity because you're really not interested in having a system with very low sensitivity to disease. So that's, that's just one of the caveats you have to think about with, with ROC analysis. A technique that's uh, really important but is, uh, is less widely seen is this idea of calibration. And it's relatively simple to understand. If you have an AI model that says, this particular patient has a 40% chance of malignancy, then if you gather up all of the patients for whom it said 40% chance, 40% of those people should in fact have malignancy. And that's what this calibration curve seeks to do. So unlike the ROC where you're trying to stay off of that diagonal line, uh, the calibration curve, uh, the ideal is 
have it right on that diagonal line so that the output of the model is well calibrated to reality. And a, another useful thing to have provided to you to understand how AI is working is the so-called confusion matrix, which very simply just shows you uh, if you have, in this case, uh, an output that is meant to be zero to four, it's understanding what the true label should be and then what the model predicts it to be. And it allows you to see where the system works well and where it has problems. And similar to that, I actually encourage authors and uh, I find it tremendously helpful and, and revealing uh, when our authors uh, include information about true positives, or, or pardon me, false positives and false negatives. This, this, these, this illustration, in fact, was from the very first paper that we published uh, in Radiology AI, and the authors provided a set of false positives and false negatives for the detection of risk factors. So you're able to see things such as uh, orthopedic hardware or IV tubing, uh, incorrectly being identified as fracture, or the fact that, that the system missed a fracture when the patient had a cast applied. So these factors are actually very important because in the same way, if we're working with our human trainees uh, and we want to make sure we understand what, what they're seeing and what they're missing, it's important as we begin to work with AI systems and we want to trust them that we know what their failure modes are, that we see problem what the where exactly they have problems as as fred mentioned as well it, it's really important to understand the uh, and it helps the the uh, trust grow trust in in these systems uh, to be able to interpret the output and uh, mauricio reyes of uh, eth sorry um, pro, uh, provided this very nice article that describes some of the challenges and opportunities with so-called XAI, explainable AI or interpretable AI, including such things as uh, describing the probability of various conditions, uh, showing where on the radiographic image uh, the computer is uh, directing its attention, perhaps some cases from its uh, archive that match the findings of the current case so that you have an understanding of what, why it, uh, from a pattern, what, it, what it's seeing, and maybe some other information that, uh, that it can provide. The caveat with, though, with that, however, is, is this article, a very nice one from Jayashree Kalpati Kramer's group, uh, that investigated the use of saliency maps um, and showed that they really uh, were not particularly trustworthy, in, uh, and they, nor were they consistent in showing the areas in the image that uh, where, where the abnormality was to be detected. So I think uh, although they can be a useful tool for helping us to see into the, the, this rather opaque mind of the AI system, um, they're, they're rather an imperfect lens. We also, as, as do uh, many others, encourage the sharing of AI models to make them available uh, where certainly the software uh, generally is available, but as well, the, the model weights, once a trained model is available to be able to uh, make that available to others so that uh, others can extend the work, test it with other data sets, uh, look for reproducibility. Uh, we understand that often there are proprietary issues uh, involved in that, but where not, it's, it's important to be able to uh, to build on the science that's available to us. And obviously there are issues often with being able to share data across institutions. There are, however, some techniques where one can place the data into a, into a repository so one can run algorithms on it without actually being able to access the data. But the goal in all of this is to assure the quality of the science by promoting reproducibility. So just with all of this, what, what could possibly go wrong with, with AI? Um, there has been a uh, uh, considerable interest in the possibility of so-called leakage uh, of data. And uh, this paper, which was a preprint in archive, picked up uh, with an editorial in Nature, um, talks about methodological issues in machine learning-based science uh, to address this problem of leakage so that it can be caught before publication. Um, we know 
that there's been a problem. And this is an article from the Korean Journal of Radiology going back uh, to 2008, uh, 2019 rather, um, that identified only a small proportion of studies that had been published in the literature used external validation. That is testing on data other than the data that were used to train the model. And this was some work uh, that came out of the group at Johns Hopkins where they looked at external validation of deep training of uh, deep learning algorithms in radiology and found that 81% showed a decrease in performance when tested on external data sets and almost a quarter of them showed a substantial decrease in their performance. So again, um, when you look at any scientific paper, I just urge that uh, you look for a hypothesis that's well-defined, testable, and ideally innovative. The methods are appropriate to the stated problem. They're described in detail and, and they use the correct metrics. The results are provided to an appropriate level of detail that one can understand and believe and trust them. And then the discussion of the work should summarize the results, place the current work into context, importantly describe its limitations and then envision future work. And remember every scientific book has limitations and Honestly, it, it's the authors should be in the best position to understand and describe those. And if, if the authors haven't, um, that, that's kind of a red flag, actually. One of the other tools uh, that, that we have to us now is the claim checklist. This is available at rsna.org slash claim. Uh, and thanks to John Mongan and, uh, of UCSF and Linda Moy, who is the uh, incoming editor for radiology. Uh, we're participants in developing this, and it's uh, a checklist that uh, one can use to describe uh, the elements that have been included, such as ones I discussed here in, uh, in various work. Also available is uh, this blog post that we had to our, our journal by one of our trainee editors, uh, where they summarize and point to a variety of the guidelines that have been used for reporting AI research. Um, and have the QR code and, and the little hash code available for you there. And as well, um, and, uh, and Dr. Pryor mentioned this as well, um, one of the challenges that we have is the potential for bias uh, and uh, across gender, race, ethnicity, uh, economic staffing, uh, all manner of things, geography. Um, and that can be introduced in, in the development of a model or uh, in its use. And this is a very nice series of uh, papers here uh, grouped together uh, that have come out of the Mayo Clinic uh, that describe approaches to help mitigate bias in radiology machine learning. So with that, just to summarize, uh, to, to get us to trustworthy AI and medical imaging, we need scientifically sound research, uh, we need principled design and implementation, and, and Fred Abley described the future AI principles. We need explainable or interpretable, interpretable results where possible, which can help us trust uh, in systems. But I, I think most importantly, we need rigorously tested AI systems to, to help us exclude bias and assure that the systems work as we think they should be. So with that, I, I thank you very much. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions. I um, see that Dr. Ko has had his hand up for quite a while. Did you have a question that you'd like to unmute and share with us? So one of our uh, attendees I see has asked a question um, about uh, what are the potential pitfalls of using saliency maps? Um, I would refer you to the article, just in the interest of time here, I think I'll refer you to the article by, uh, by Kalpatra Kramer and, and uh, her colleagues um, that was published in Radiology AI. It, it actually goes into quite a bit of detail with some of the challenges that, uh, that we have with uh, the saliency map. One of the things is it does be very sensitive to initial conditions within, uh, within the development of these systems. There's another question that came up earlier, and I, I typed an answer, a quick answer, which was that many AI tools are. Fred, I don't, I'm not hearing you. That's interesting. Um, well, I, are you hearing me now? 
I can hear you, Fred. Okay, that's interesting because I am unmuted, but um, the there was a question that uh, came up in the uh, Q and A about the fact that developers of commercial tools don't share the software that was used to train them, and should they? Well, the short answer is yes, but that's a lot of data. Uh, and at least in the US, the FDA tries to sequester this data. Uh, so it would be better if they would publish metrics on the quality of their data in terms of you know, uh, the elimination of bias, whether or not it was properly representative of the population. And I think that would be more useful for us than actually the data. But you know, the shorter answer is yes, you should be able to see how the model was trained. It just, that's a difficult problem to solve. Are there other questions? Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more in the Q and A. Um, I wanna thank my colleague, Dr. Khan, for um, even though he comes up as Dr. Pryor and thank all of you for joining us. Um, I believe this will be, uh, the recording will be posted on the ICCIS website so it can be uh, viewed later at your leisure. And we thank you very much for joining us today.